Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Ask Kate, brought to you by the Children's Tumor Foundation. Today I want to talk a little bit in my last video before we take a little break. This is the end of season one of Ask Kate, and we'll be starting up again in the new year, coming back with season two. So stay tuned for that. And while I'm gone, over the um, course of the next couple of months, a couple of things to know. So first, please keep sending me your questions. My email is always below and I love hearing from you. And it's really helpful for me to know what kind of videos you're wanting. For example, today I'm going to talk about something that is applies across the NF spectrum, but then with a focus on NF2 at the end. And part of the reason for that is that I'm aware of the fact that most of these videos are specific to NF1. Um, and that is somewhat because that's who I'm hearing from, which is great. But I do want to hear from our whole community. So those of you who are living or caring for someone with NF2 or schwannomatosis, you know, please reach out to me and ask your questions. I, I love hearing from you. So keep that up even while I'm away. Um, the second thing is that in October, we're going to have eight weeks on Tuesdays right here in the Children's Tumor YouTube space of Tumor Talk. And that's going to be a really uh, fantastic uh, set of videos that we've produced for you guys. I think you'll really enjoy them. So please stay tuned and, and be back for those. Okay, so let's get to today, today's topic. So what I want to talk a little bit about first is um, how to talk to your to a child about a new diagnosis of NF1 or NF2 um, and what that might look like and some of the challenges that you might face. The second thing I want to talk about is what that specifically looks like in NF2. Um, one thing we've talked about before is that NF2 is most often diagnosed in early adulthood. We usually see the first symptoms that lead to a diagnosis uh, on average around the age of 20. But I do hear from families um, with some regularity that have children that are a bit or even a lot younger than that who had symptoms and got that diagnosis earlier on. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that also. So to start, let's talk about talking to your kid about a diagnosis of NF1 or NF2. I understand, as a parent myself, that that can be really overwhelming. And there's really two, two situations that you might face. One would be a child who's been diagnosed with something from infancy, mostly, most commonly that would be NF1, and you need to make a decision about when and how to reveal information to your kiddo as they're getting older. The other um, situation would be a child who's being diagnosed older where you and your child may discover and learn about the diagnosis at the same time. So let's take the first situation. There's no perfect time to talk to your kiddo about NF1. Some families choose to just roll it into family life. So as the child grows up, they know the words, they know the name, they go to walks, they're involved in the CTF or NF community, and it just sort of becomes a part of their identity and it's not something that becomes a, a big conversation to have at one point. Um, and if that's the way that you choose to do that, um, I think that can work very well for a lot of families and a lot of kiddos. And if you're doing it that way, then I think what you need to be thinking about as a parent is just continuing to create space for your kiddo as they get older and their understanding of what it means to have a condition like this is maturing. They're going to have new questions. And the last thing we want is for a, you know an 11-year-old kiddo to go on to Google and start Googling, you know, things about NF1 because a lot of parents know that you're going to see kind of the scariest images or the worst case scenarios. That's just kind of how the internet works. So we, I always encourage families to just continue to open up that space for your kiddos as they're getting older to ask you questions, to feel involved in their doctor's appointments, to feel free to speak up and to ask, to say, hey, I'm having a new pain or, or my friend was making fun of my, my cafe au lait spots and I don't know what to do about that. Um, we want the, your children to feel confident to be able to talk to you and to talk to their doctors, their whole care team, about how they're feeling and how things might be going for them. So if you're in the other situation where maybe you've chosen to kind of uh, keep the diagnosis um, separate and it's not something your kid knows and you're going to need to talk to them about it at some point, um, then I would recommend that you think through their developmental stage um, and that pay attention to when they start asking you questions. Say, why do I have to go to the doctor more than my other friend? Or why did I have to get that MRI with the machine, the noisy machine? Um, when they start really asking you those questions, I would say that's, that's a good sign that they are ready to, to understand and to know more. So again, we don't want your child to get to a situation where they're old enough to know something's wrong, but they don't know how to ask you about it, and so then they try to figure it out on their own, and that can go badly. So again, just thinking through your individual child, their developmental stage, their personality, 
and working with them on, on understanding what NF is. CTF has a lot of great resources that can help with that. We have uh, brochures that are specifically for teenagers with NF1. In the NF2 newly diagnosed guidebook, there is a, a section about you know, being a parent of a teenager. There's also um, some information about teenagers with NF2 themselves. So please use those resources and, um, and reach out to me too. If you're having difficulty explaining something to your kiddo or they have a question, they can email me. I would love to hear from them. I'm happy to, I'm happy to do that. So let's jump just quickly um, over to what it looks like to have a child diagnosed with NF2 um, on the earlier than average end of things. So like we talked about, um, statistically speaking, the average diagnosis of NF2 is closer to about 20 years old. And the reason for that is because that's when symptoms first start occurring. So this can happen um, where symptoms happen much earlier in life. And so just to review, the earliest symptoms of NF2 are commonly going to be any kind of hearing loss, ringing in the ears, which the doctor will call tinnitus, or any um, problems with balance, um, but that's that's obviously not a great way to know something might be wrong if you're looking at a very young child because they often have trouble with balance because they're learning to walk and they're learning to run and that's all very normal developmentally. Um, so a lot of times we will see something with a hearing change in children. The other thing we do see is juvenile cataracts. Now that can occur outside of NF2 and so I, I, I like to be cautious about scaring anyone that juvenile cataracts means they have NF2. Um, that's that's certainly not the case, but it can be a part of um, of a diagnosis in children. So any changes in vision would need to be evaluated by um, a pediatrician with a referral possibly to a neuro ophthalmologist, which is just a highly specialized physician who uh, who looks at the eyes and the way that the eyes are interacting with the brain. So. Um, those are usually the early signs. We can see also headaches, but again, headaches in children are very common and they can have a, a ton of different reasons for having headaches, so that's not a terribly helpful early symptom. If it's going along with something like hearing, you know, hearing changes or hearing loss, vision changes, then of course that's something you want to see your physician about and talk to your doctor. Um, but it can be sometimes difficult, I think, for our NF2 community when a lot of people are being diagnosed as adults or young adults, and then you're a parent with a young child who's getting that same diagnosis. And so if that's you and you're watching these videos, I would love to hear from you. I would love to hear more about your experience, and I would love to hear any questions you have about what it, you know, what that looks like for you. Um, yeah, and just in general questions about having a child who's on the younger end and has that diagnosis. Okay, well, thank you so much for tuning in to Ask Kate. I really hope that you will stay tuned in October and November as we come back here with the Tumor Talk videos and that you'll be back here in January with me for season two of Ask Kate. And I also hope that you will keep sending me those questions because I love hearing from you guys. And I love even when I get the, the emails that are your stories and there might not be a specific question, I really like hearing from you and I hope that you'll keep it up. Thanks so much, everyone. And I will see you in the new year.